we got another SSD for recovery and this time it's a one terabyte extreme portable SSD by SanDisk in this gray jacket. Now about 20% of SSDs that we get for data recovery these days are exact same unit. There are several different failure types that we see with these units. Today we're going to discuss the most common one if it happens to be so on the inside. I'll show you what I look at during that diagnostic process in order to narrow down the issue. The best news about these is that most of the time they are recoverable. I haven't came across a single unit that I haven't been able to recover yet. So as far as the recoverability goes, it's an amazing device. I absolutely love this brand and uh, I wish they made more and sold more of these, obviously for my business purposes. <laughs> but if you found yourself in a struggling situation where information that you had on this got trapped and now you can no longer access it, two things. In the link of this video, you can find a software that you can download as a demo version. Don't pay for it upfront. Download it and see if that software can detect the unit. The scanning process will take some time. It's going to go through the blocks. And if you see those blocks being different color, then you're on the right path. But if your device like this does show up on some sort of level, but not giving you exact size or all the blocks that you're scanning can turn up with absolutely no data, the issue most likely is related to some components that we're going to discuss today and showcase in this video. So first thing I do, I always open this thing up. It's got like a little cover up here on the side. You can get like a blade in there or something to start prying it up. Now, if you don't have uh, the tools, first thing I recommend doing, guys, is watch this video till the end because the there's some things that could go wrong at the very beginning uh, that will uh, make your um, recovery attempt miserable right at the start. So watch the video first, see if this is something that you're you know up for because um, if you're not, your best bet would be to send it here because uh, time and time again we get cases that just come in and they're beat up so badly that uh, leaves client wishing that they haven't tried to do anything prior to sending it in. Because you know how it goes. At first you want to try yourself, but then you want to pay anything in the world to uh, actually get it done by somebody who knows what they're doing. So these things are best approached at the start when it, before it's too late, you know. So um, number one. Thing that I always start off with is uh, removing both of these screws that hold uh, the unit in a chassis and make sure that you're very very careful with extracting the uh, device because it's uh, it, it uses very very tacky double-sided tape in this section right here holding these two boards together and uh, because there are tons of components that are very very important in this area right here you may end up knocking some of them off or breaking uh, uh, balls underneath the controller and uh, c'est la vie, you know. So um, you guys really would want to pay attention to that. Um, getting it out of here on this side, it's not very difficult. It's not held in very tough. And the whole thing is basically just kind of pressed into this thermal pad. Okay, so the chassis can now be removed. Usually what I do is I take this little rubber gasket off, put it in the chassis. Both screws go back in the chassis. And I lock it in. We're not going to come back to it for a while. Um, this part here, uh, I would heat it up just before I remove it. You know, maybe secure it in the vise first. Temperature setting should, shouldn't be too much. Uh, you probably would want to keep it at the lowest just to warm up the glue. You definitely don't want to flex it up because if you do, this will put a lot of pressure right at the beginning there. What I have prepared here also is a couple of uh, units 
that will save us a bunch of time. So this device right here, probably best if we mark it with something. This is just a ground plane, so I'm, I'll put a little X on it, just so that I know that's the unit we need to recover, because I got two more right here from previous cases. I'm gonna use this device for testing, uh, making sure that we get same type of voltages when it's connected to power. Get my PC3000 portable. All right, that's, that's how the adapter looks like. Slide this in. When I switch over to the screen here, uh, power up, we see that it's consuming 100 milliamps, right? Uh, but we have no PHY light come on. The fact that it's glowing red here doesn't matter. It's probably from previous case. Yeah, if I turn off the power, it still stay on. And uh, when we got this happening, let's have a look at the microscope view. Uh, I set the multimeter to DC mode. Let's measure out the capacitors that are around this uh, power management IC. So here we got 3.3 volts on this one. We have absolutely nothing on this one. Nothing happening here. Nothing happening here. Three and three. Nothing. 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 So it looks like we got some problems with this power management I see. It's 90430VM330. Turn the power off of this unit and set it aside. Let's power on the donor device. It's consuming 400 and we get it recognized. So we get 3 and 3 here. We get 0 0.9, 0 0.8 here. That's also 0 0.8, 3.3, 3.3. Zero point eight, two point five, one point two. Like there is a lot of different voltages around here, and at the end, We get 2.5 and 1.2. 2.5 and 1.2 is what we need by the NAND. Let's turn off this device here. One of the most common failures with this device is that power management IC. So uh, it's, as you can see, it's surrounded by um, epoxy-like material. This thing is called underfill and uh, before we can remove the chip we need to get rid of that underfill. So I'm gonna go ahead and prepare the area around it by scraping it off. Uh, using hot air at like 250 degrees can tremendously help lifting out that glue and cleaning up the board. And this is what the SSD will look like once it's removed and you can see that glue gets in to like almost underneath the chip and seals it off. So I don't know what happens, but maybe due to heat, some of these connections um, internally break and uh, the device no longer supplies power uh, to where it needs to go. I haven't played around with original, but every time I would get the device that behaves this way, 
I would swap out that PMIC with something that comes off of a working device. Uh, here is the one that I already prepped for you guys. We can try to reuse the one that we have because my, my biggest suspicion is that PMIC is not dead, but uh, it's the solder joints underneath it that lose connection and that's what creates that problem. But here uh, is the removed PMIC from this device and I already rebolted. it. Rebolding it is pretty easy if you have a stencil. Uh, I just use this generic stencil that's got a variety of different um, pitches and sizes for uh, the pads. Now I'm going to just set this aside. Let's go ahead and uh, remove the glue from our patient and when the patient has uh, all the glue removed we can just Put this new component on there well new for the device but not new really uh, and uh, get it going i mean i'm pretty sure that that is going to be the case because um, other issues that i've seen with these devices do have other symptoms this falls directly into category of that pmic failing yeah without heat this thing is uh, very tough to remove but with heat it's not too bad. I'm going to actually um, go easy on it because before we use a brand new one, I want to check if my theory about uh, disconnected pads underneath it would apply here. Uh, two things we have in a way. Uh, number one is uh, this component and number two is this component because I want to come in and pick up this chip with the spatula flux here. So here's what I'll do. I will uh, scrape up a little bit of this mask. You don't have to do this but this is just something I think will make it easier for me and uh, I'll tin this, those two spots And the underfill will just kind of peel off almost.
I think that's pretty good. Let's have a look at what uh, stencil will work. We need to have the same pitch as this component, super tiny. I think this one right here will do the trick for us. Yeah, so you see it lines up perfectly. I'll put it just right in the corner there. Let's have a look at what we end up with. I think this is going to be perfect. Look at that. That's as good as new. So if the connection issue was related to that, then the problem is solved and we will have a working device. All right, our PCB is cool. Let's uh, slap it back into the place. Yeah, before we do this, I want to make sure I isolate all these uh, pads that got exposed on the mask. This will like seal off everything we don't need. See, if we, if we leave them exposed like that, uh, there's a good chance that uh, one of the solder balls will slip into it and uh, short something out. So just make sure we cover up. everything that's exposed here. It curves with uh, UV light, so I have a really good one. It gets it done really fast. Super efficient thing. And this is the last one. Now the reason I want to separate these two is that the balls, if they have to flow across that whole bar unseparated, there's a good chance that they're gonna get uh, stretched out and eventually if they're not tall enough, they will not make connection anymore. Done. And that over there. Okay, now back to the rework and in a few minutes we should have a working device again, hopefully. Okay, it snapped into place. Alright, up here, uh, Return of the Jedi. Uh, we gotta take these two chips and two, two of these components and put them back. The capacitor.
This was pretty much textbook, guys. Connected to PC3000. Let's power on the unit. And we got PHY light come up. And we got actual proper reading is uh, proper consumption as we used to get on a working device let's have a look how this unit reacts in the universal utility and if we got id i want to test if it has access to the uh, uh, user area user area is where the data is kept the id comes up guys we are in sector edit first sector and the last sector. If we can access first and last sector, that means anything in between is just a matter of imaging. PC3000 can easily clone this thing up, but I'm testing my DeepSpar unit and I just want to see what kind of speeds we can obtain with this device. And it gives us an option of selecting all these channels. We're going to select channel A for M.2 key and BME device. Power up and start the unit. Uh, let's see how it does. Execute. So it's pushing close to 200 megabytes per second. It's definitely a good indicator of speed and uh, within an hour and 20 minutes or so we should have a full image uh, of this device. But yeah overall guys that's uh, pretty much it. The whole uh, solution explained. This kind of stuff happens to about 80% of these SSDs that we get. 20% uh, come in with a bit more complex problem. When we have one of those, I will be more than, than delighted to show you what it is and how to solve it. But for now, that's what we could show in this kind of situation. So if you guys have a failed SanDisk Extreme portable SSD, you know who to call, you know where to go. Link in description will take you to our website where you can request a service so um, let us know and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have that solved for you.